I had this idea for a talk, and I'm hopefully going to be able to reuse some of the content for today. But if not, you're the first one to listen to this uh, Asia functions or going serverless with Asia functions. Um, so this is the first one. And I made a small agenda. I don't know if maybe you want to turn off the lights, maybe? See if I can turn off. So you can actually see what's up there. Um, so what is serverless and this whole idea behind going serverless? So that's what I will start with, and then I'll talk a little bit about how Azure Function fits into this uh, paradigm. And then again, what can we build with Azure Function as the services today? And then how we're going to build something with Azure Functions and how we're going to deploy to Azure Functions. And then I'll just end up with some tips and tricks that I have collected over the projects that I've used it in. I'm not going to write a lot of like code that you write inside your function today. I'll more talk about the ecosystem around Azure Functions because I'm assuming you're .NET developers or maybe some other form of developers, so you can know how to write code. So I'm not going to teach you any of that. I'm going to tell you about the platform and how it works and how you can get most of it. So I hope that's OK. Uh, and please do interrupt me and ask questions if you have any or if something it's not clear or you don't understand my English or whatever, please interrupt. It makes a lot more fun presentation if you're involved. Um, just this one slide about myself, uh, because you probably don't know me that well. Uh, I've been a developer for a long time. I started coding when I was 10 years, 11 years old. Uh, I didn't start with classic.net. Uh, I'm not that, that young, I guess. Uh, I started with HTML, like pretty much everyone wants to build a web page when you're young. Mine was about cheat codes for games, but that's kind of irrelevant. Then I moved on eventually to .NET and classic ASP is where I started and moved into .NET as I got my first job. And I've actually been a .NET developer for my entire professional career. Um, I have been exposed to quite a lot of Azure over the years. I was very intrigued by this whole cloud platform when it first came out, so I spent a lot of free time on actually investigating what was possible with Azure in the beginning. And in my previous, in the previous job I had, I was allowed to take some of the first certification that was there for Azure, but we never got any clients in the beginning, so I didn't really get to use it in the very beginning. But as of lately, the last few years, I've worked exclusively via Azure projects. And as some of you might know, many Azure projects is lift and shift of virtual machines to the cloud. I don't do any of that. It's not interesting to me. I only do development, custom development, and I use the cloud as my hosting platform. Um, it's not true. I sometimes do virtual machines as well, but that's not my focus. My focus is to develop apps and use the cloud for that. And apps is both web and mobile. Uh, yeah, I live here in Malmo, so it's easy for me to come by and give a talk today. And uh, yeah, I have built some stuff that is out there that you can use, some open source stuff. If you want to get a SSL certificate for your custom domain and your website is hosted in Azure, I have a site extension that is fairly popular that can help you with getting a free SSL certificate from this service called Let's Encrypt. And I am a CTO of a small startup that we are running on the side. Um, and that's also hosted in Azure and uses a lot of the services up there. Yeah, so that's me. Let's get to the main part of today's presentation. So what is serverless? Uh, it's, of course, serverless sounds like boss if you're a marketing stuff because nothing is serverless. That should be obvious to every one of us in here. Um, but it's, the point of it is that you don't have to care about the server. So you can program stuff without caring about what this is going to run on and how the infrastructure is laid out. Um, and why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because we as developers are asked to deliver more faster every day. And if we, don't, if we spend all our time nurturing our virtual machines or our physical machines, then we, we're not spending the time that, that on what we're good at, and that's developing stuff. So that's why we, I mean, there might be other people that are not interested in serverless because their job is to maintain infrastructure. But us who's interested in coding, we want to look at solutions that can help us focus 
on coding and not so much on all the other stuff. So why is serverless getting popular? I tried to look it up and first time the word was used in, was in 2012 in some academic papers. And so it's fairly new concept or idea. Yeah, but the first time a commercial product that really caught on with this is the Amazon's uh, Lambda, which is basically what Microsoft is trying to copy with Azure Functions. So Amazon's Lambda is a place where you can go in Amazon and you can say, I want to write a function and you write your 10 lines of code that's the function and then they will host it for you and they'll run it for you, but you don't really have to care about any of that. You just have your function, whatever it does, can call external web services, it can do some calculations, that's up to you and your application, but that's running somewhere and that's all you have to care about. Uh, of course, there's other things you have to care about. How do I get my code there? And what is the lifetime of my function? And things like that. But the idea behind it is that you write some code and you put it somewhere in the cloud and everybody can call your code if you feel like everybody should call it. Um, so it's also known as backend as a service or function as a service, uh, depending on which cloud provider you go to, basically. Um, so why is functions interesting? It's interesting because it helps solve some of the really hard problems that we have to deal with uh, often. Uh, what if your application is not under a constant load? I mean, you have spikes in users or spikes in traffic. Functions promises to solve that and you don't have to worry about how big your server is. They'll just throw more compute power at your execution of your functions if you get more traffic, for instance. And with that elasticity or dynamicness of your functions, you also get supposedly the cheapest possible pricing because you don't have to pay for overcapacity of your servers. You don't have to pay for a big server because you once a year have a Super Bowl or Black Friday traffic. I don't know, of course, everything you have to take with a grain of salt because it can be that the function's runtime will not be able to cope with the amount of traffic that you get. But for most scenarios, it will actually handle a spike in traffic just fine. And if you know you have like a big event coming up, you can of course test your functions apps just that you could test any other app uh, to make sure. Um, so maybe to set thing in perspective here, I took this slide here that compares virtual machines. There's no physical machines because, I don't know, does any of you use physical machines anymore for any production workloads? Nobody dares to say so. I mean, there might be some. <laughs> no, 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 there might be some that's still using it. It's, that's totally okay. But this is more like, people are talking a lot about containers. Uh, you might have heard about it. And a lot of people talk about virtual machines and what is, yeah, the unit of scale is obviously the machine here. If it's a container, you have a container, there's an application inside the container, that's what you scale. But in serverless, you scale the function, so you have many, if there's many caller to your function, you can have many functions able to accept the call. And there's other abstractions with virtual machines, hardware, with serverless, it's the, the function runtime that's different depending on which provider you pick. Yeah. But some of the big differences are with serverless or functions, you run your code on demand. And another thing that's very different from the other ones is that it's not supposed to be a long running function. Then you have designed something, you did something wrong in your design. It's supposed to be something that can complete in seconds if you're going for the upper bound, but hopefully milliseconds. Yeah. So if you have some process today that takes hours to complete, then that's not something you should just cram inside a function, that's not gonna <coughs> work, at least not with Azure functions. Quick question then. Yeah. Does uh, Azure functions have a, do they apply a, a time limit? So if you, yes. you're killed. Yeah, you're killed after five minutes. Uh, we'll get back to that because that has a lot of implications on all sorts of, of application and yeah. So that's there's some tricks there you need to be aware of. Yeah. And yeah, I only took the two biggest cloud providers here or Amazon and Azure, and that's probably because I don't know anything about Google and IBM stacks, but so they have the Lambda function, Lambda, and we have uh, in Azure, we have Azure functions. And yeah, there's 
stuff for containers in both clouds and stuff for virtual machines. Um, yeah, so, so what is Azure Functions? Yeah, so Microsoft was a little late to this game. Uh, I think uh, AWS Lambda was released in 2014, or maybe 2015, it was generally available. Uh, but Microsoft didn't have this until last year, uh, around this time last year, was the public preview of Azure Functions. So they had to come up with something because they could see Amazon getting momentum. And this is a, like a gateway drug to the cloud. I can write five lines of code, go to Amazon, go to Azure, and I can have my code hosted there. And then I'm in the cloud already. And I just have a simple service that can do something. Uh, but then I found out, oh, I need a database. Okay, I'm already in Azure where I'm going to look for the database, probably in the Azure cloud. So then they gradually get you hooked to more of their services. So it was a problem for Microsoft to not have a service like AWS Lambda because a lot of people would start up with a simple Lambda function and then they would need, okay, I need some data storage, I need some file storage, I need a lot of things. And then they would just pick stuff from the Amazon stack and they would not look at what Microsoft had. So Microsoft had to come up with a competitive answer to this. And that's why they released Azure Function at the build event in 2016. Uh, so, but it's not a new service. They might market it as a completely new service, but actually it's just a lot of pieces that they already had. So if you are familiar with Azure, they have something called Azure Web Apps. That's basically a platform for hosting websites. Inside Azure Web Apps, they invented something called Azure Web Jobs that is jobs that can run inside the web app. And they took pieces of that web job functionality and made it into its own service, which became Azure Functions. And as we go through the presentation today, you'll see there's a lot of things that actually is because they took some existing code and turned it into this Azure Functions. Um, so, so that's why they got to market fast because they're probably taken by surprise a little bit. Um, and then also they had some new services coming out uh, last year, Microsoft uh, Logic Apps, which is a, like a workflow engine with a designer interface where you can connect services together and do like workflow based tasks. And Microsoft Flow, which is the same service basically, but just focused on end users. So if you as an end user want to have an SMS every time somebody sends you an email where the, that's flagged as important, then you can build that in Flow without knowing anything about code. You can just go in and click some buttons and then it will build that for you. Or you want to have every email you get with attachment, you want the attachment stored in OneDrive. That's also something you can build with Flow. Uh, but sometimes a graphical user interface where you drag and drop things together is not going to solve all problems in the world. Sometimes you have to write code and that's where Azure Functions comes in because now you have an easy place to write those five lines of code instead of having to set up a web service and having to make an API that you can call, now you have all this stuff in Azure Functions. Um, so yeah, that's some of the reasons behind it. Um, then it actually is packaged Azure Functions as a, what's called a site extension. That's also a concept from Azure Web Apps. So you can have extensibility modules to your Azure Web Apps as these site extensions. And that's basically how they install this function on top of an existing Azure Web App. Uh, there's of course some things that Microsoft can do because it's their product that I'm, we can build site extensions too. That's how that SSL extension is made. That's a site extension. Uh, but they can do stuff that we can't do. So basically they can pre-install stuff on the machines that they need for this to run. Uh, but you can download the Azure Functions runtime as a site extension and then install it manually. Yeah. And then the promise of Azure Functions is the easiest way to get started with writing code in the cloud, in their cloud. And that's what we're gonna demo because we have to show you some code. So basically, there's this link here. I don't know if we should be in full screen mode. Oh, this stuff going on. Maybe you wanna see that it's actually inside the browser. Uh, but yeah, it goes to this, this is not what you should use for anything real, but it's just to demo stuff. They have this web page here, and I'm actually logged in because I cheated a little bit, but it'll ask you to log in with either a Gmail account, a GitHub, or Microsoft Live ID. And then when you're signed in here, they spin up a function runtime for you that has 
60 minutes before they kill it again, so you can't build anything real. But if you want to have a service running for 60 minutes, you can use this. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, and I, uh, I don't know why I ended up here. Maybe it's my old session, because usually it asks you what kind of thing I want to build. Uh, but right now it just built me a web API for me, basically. So this is the IDE in the browser that you get with Azure Functions. And this is the code <coughs> that they put in my sample application. So basically this is a web API that I can call, and then it will respond with the name that I put in the query string, or it will tell me, ah, you didn't put any name in the query string. Um, and just to prove that this is actually something that was working, we can click here and then if we are lucky, there should be an URL, but uh, there's not. Let's try to. So this is, this is the URL for this function. Uh, so basically you can see here there's some Maybe you can't see it, but there's a randomly generated function name in front of the .azure website. So you know it's an Azure website hosted thing, this function. And then they, there's an API and there's the name of this function. It's called HTTP trigger C sharp one. And then there's a code. And that's because this function is actually behind an auth. You have to authorize yourself to be able to call this function. You could make an anonymous function if you wanted to. But per default, you have to know this code in order to be able to call it. And I, if I just post that into the browser here, it will, it will tell me, well, it's not very pretty, but because it's just an API we're building. You have to put a name in the. So if I do that, name, hello. Then it should just respond with Okay, bad example. Well, let's move on. <laughs> I don't know, the, this one is apparently, I think we have my old session somehow that I created before I drove over here, so it's a little crabby, but this is how you could get started and the promise that it's very easy to get started with writing code. I'll show you a little later how to write some real code. This is just, to prove that it's super fast at getting up and running. And oops, did I? Oh yeah, that's sorry. So, so to give you a little background on how this environment is working, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of uh, Azure Web Apps because as I told you, function is something that runs on top of Azure Web Apps. Um, and as you can see, it basically started in, in 2013 with Azure Websites was the name back then, was released to the, to the public. And then they announced this add-on, Azure Web Jobs, that doesn't cost anything, it's just part of having an Azure website, you can run these jobs in the background. Um, then they rebranded everything in 2015 and called it Azure App Service. The website thing is still there, but now there's some extra services you can call. It. There's a mobile app uh, service, and there's a logic app service, and there's an API app service, and there's still the mo uh, web app service. Didn't really change anything, the services were still there. But it makes it a bit confusing because the names change and I sometimes still refer to things with the old names still. Uh, then last year they announced this Azure Functions in preview. So that means that everybody could try it out, but Microsoft said, yeah, don't use this for production, we might break it, but you could still try it out. And then they made it, uh, well, this is a funny little twist, but they had a, this Azure Web Apps runs on Windows machines, uh, but actually last year they also made it run on Linux machines with .NET Core. So you can actually now pick when you create an Azure web app, do I want this to run on Windows or Linux? There's a lot of things that doesn't work on the Linux machine, to be honest, but you have two options still. 
Yeah. And other funny things that happened last year in October was that this flow thing got announced. So that's why we kind of need some place to write some code. And yeah, then functions became generally available in November last year. So it's fairly new service, obviously, uh, but it has some history with uh, the Azure web apps. And <coughs> now I mentioned some other services along the way that you might not have heard of um, besides this few words I told you about them. <coughs> but basically you have to know that function that's targeted developers. It, you can't use it for anything if you're not a developer. The design tools or the IDE or what do you want to call it, that's either Visual Studio Code or the real one, or you can use the browser if you feel like. Web jobs, that's pretty much only Visual Studio Code or the real one, uh, because you have to write a class library basically. So it's kind of hard to do in the browser. You might be able to find some editors, but flow that's only browser and logic apps that's both if you want to. And yeah, you can scale the things, uh, the way functions work, the, the way they market it at least, is that it works dynamically. So you don't have to worry about what, how big your machine is and how much load it can handle. They will take care of that for you. So you can host it on a dynamic hosting plan that does that for you. But you can also pick and host it on a traditional hosting plan where you just buy one machine or two machines and then you can't really scale more than that. So that's up to you when you build your function app to pick what kind of hosting platform. For web jobs, you are forced to be on the, the hosting plan where you get X amount of machines that you pick. So yes. Um, so what can we build with them? Well, anything, or at least depends on your imagination. But there's, of course, there's some hooks that will help you build certain kinds of applications. So they have, the way functions work is that there's some, something needs to trigger the execution of the function. And that can be a, an external event. In most cases, that's the, what it is. But it can also be a timer. So the first one here is a timer. So you can write a function every day at 12 o'clock, please do some order processing or call some external website and scrape all the data from it or whatever it is you want to do. That's something you can use a, fun a timer for and then it will just do that. Then you might want to store that data that you retrieve somewhere. So the function will need to output data something. And there's also bindings for that. So there's binding for storing data in document DB, which is Microsoft NoSQL solution in Azure. Or you can store it in Event Hub. Um, and there's also Azure storage, so blob storage or table storage. Um, but it, so that was if you had a timer that triggered something. But it could also be that you had, like we saw, or I tried to show you in the demo, there was an HTTP request that triggered the execution of the function. And then, of course, you can make HTTP request, but you can also do webhooks and they have some integrations for GitHub and Slack. There might be others there, but so they have some pre-built integration points with external services. And there are some service so that you can actually integrate with other Azure services. And there's of course queues, either service bus queues or Azure storage queues uh, that you can use to either take input from or you can write out to a queue. Um, so this is like what it can integrate with very easily, but of course you can integrate with everything that you can write code that, can, that makes you able to talk to whatever service. So there's not really any limits, but this is just the out of the box integration that it comes with. Um, then you can write code in many languages, uh, C sharp, F sharp, JavaScript, Bass, PHP, Python, PowerShell, or any other form that you can actually make an executable out of that can run on this Windows machine. Yeah. But to tell you the truth, there's pretty much only two options that are really good right now, and that's JavaScript or C Sharp. You, if you want to do it in F Sharp or some of the other ones, there might be a lot of issues. So if you're okay with dealing with issues, then you can pick any of these languages. But if you want some a good experience, then stick with JavaScript or C Sharp for now. 
Uh, and that's probably because it's a fairly small team that builds this thing and they can't test every new feature on all the platforms. And like, if you're over here, all these integration things, that's not there. Uh, that's only in these three. That's why the parentheses on those things. Um, so, so, yeah, so some typical scenarios. Let's say you're building a website and that's just plain HTML and some JavaScript, uh, but that's not good enough. They want to build, they want to have like an email or contact form that sends an email. Then, ah, oh, now, now I need some backend code. Well, well, maybe you don't. Maybe you can just take an Azure Functions and have your backend code running in there that can send the email or. So that's kind of the scenarios that you have some, a lot of front end logic and then, oh, now I get to a point in my development where I need something that runs on a server, but I don't really need the whole server because I have a single service, I have a handful of services. That's where functions can help you. And that's also very common in mobile app scenarios. So you have a mobile app, um, it can take pictures, stores the pictures on the phone, um, but you want to do some some processing that you can't really do on the phone, maybe because the library is not on the phone or maybe because it's too heavy to do on the phone, then you could send the picture to an Azure function and it can do the processing and you get the processed image returned to the phone app. So that's the typical scenarios. But it can also be that you're having some data processing scenarios. So it could be that IoT scenarios you have some sensors on all the buses in Copenhagen and they produce a lot of data and you don't really, you, you're not confident that you can build a solution that will scale. So you pick something that will help you with that. So that could be Azure Functions. So all the sensor data is sent to an Azure Functions or maybe it's sent to something else in Azure, but it will be part of that pipeline that you will have in your IoT scenario. It could also be that you just need some place to run some code that runs with a specific frequency like I need my index rebuilt, I need my thumbnail generated in my image library, or I need watermarks on all the images that people uploaded. And then you can use it for those kind of maintenance tasks. Yeah. So that's the typical scenarios. But there's a lot of people that are, have a good imagination and use it for other strange things. So there's not really any limits. And this is going back to the architecture, how things are structured. Um, so Azure Functions, the, what you've seen so far is the little function app that is in here. That was the code I showed you. But that is inside or hosted in the runtime. So that's that side extension that is installed by Microsoft when you pick an Azure Function app. But that lives in the web app and the web app has to be hosted somewhere and that's where the service plans comes in. And the service plan was where we could pick either the dynamic option or the, I need this machine of size, that. So there's two options here. <coughs> and then when you're on the dynamic plan, you obviously need something to trigger your function because your function is not running. Uh, so if you have like the run at midnight every day, if your app is not running, there's nothing to wake it up. So they have some things running outside of your app service that will wake it up at midnight every day to execute it. If it's a HTTP request coming in, there's also the central listener that will wake up your app. So if your app is asleep or your function is asleep, it'll be slow for the first user hitting it. But they try to make that wake up time as fast as possible. But that's something you have to be aware of if you're using the dynamic plane that your code is not necessarily running when you get the request. They have to wake it up and run it. And then they need some storage and that's mainly for logs and other maintenance things. So you need a storage account to run a function app. Um, yeah, so the pricing. Um, yeah, there's the consumption plan where you pay for as much as you use. And there's the app service plan where you say, I want a machine this size, and then you pay for the size of that machine, regardless of your function is called once a month or it's called a million times a month. Um, the consumption plan is a little, it's good if you're not getting called a lot. It might not be good if you're very active, it might be better for you to be on the app service plan. But that's only if your load is somewhat steady and you can predict it, because if your load is like one day, you just need to service tens of millions of requests, 
then your app service plan, that's, you need to scale that or you need to have that dynamically scale fast enough. So it's kind of like, it, it's, you have to pick and choose and think about the trade-offs when you select what, where you want to be. Uh, but with the consumption plan, if you just need that one job running every night, every day, then it's going to be like basically free for you because it doesn't cost that much to run it. It's more like if you have many requests. But, yeah. Is it complicated to move the function between? No, it's super easy. Uh, so it, you can start out with the dynamic or the consumption plan. Dynamic and consumption, that's... They changed the name from dynamic to consumption, but it's the same thing. Uh, so you can start out there and then find out, okay, it, it would be better for my wallet if I'm down here, and then you just move it over. And you, that's basically the web apps that we saw here. That can just be moved. This thing can be moved around between different service plans, no problem. So you don't have to do any changes. Um, and yeah, there's a slide down here with how to calculate it. This is the example from the web page. So it's fairly complicated to calculate how much it costs to run a function. Um, because you need to know how much, how long was it executing for and how much memory did it consume while it executed. And it's something that you probably wouldn't know about an application until you build it. So it's not like you can't sit down and estimate this. You make some worst case estimates, but you have to test it to find the real life. Yeah. Do, they have, do they have some tooling about that? Not really, no. Do they have this thing where you can replace it with your own values? Um, so, but basically... Uh, but do, you, do you get numbers when you run it? Do you get numbers to see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you get how many times it was executed and stuff like that. Um, but the memory, I think you have to set up the performance counter yourself and oh. actually monitor it. Um, so, yeah. So now I actually want to show you how to make the function the normal way because then we'll go through all the steps. Um, oops. So this is the Azure portal that you might be familiar with or you might not. Um, let's just assume that you're familiar with it. So I'll not spend a whole lot of time. So basically you go in and say, I want to create a new service here and you just search for functions, a function. And then they'll find it for you here. And then you can create one, super easy, it shouldn't take many seconds. So you need to give it a name here. And again, we can see here that the similarities with Azure Web Apps because it's actually hosted on the same uh, subdomain from Azure website. So, so let's hope that's not taken. And then you pick your subscription, you put it in a resource group, which is kind of the container for Azure things that you can do rights or permissions on and stuff like that. Just do, okay. and then here you have to pick which plan type do I want. And I'll just do the consumption plan because then it will be free when I forget to delete it. <laughs> and then you pick your location. And then it'll create a storage account for you down here, but you could also select a storage account that you already have if you don't want this auto-generated one. But Let's just create this one. So this is all there is to it if you want to create it from the portal. Uh, and then it'll take two minutes to deploy. Boom, boom, boom. And then we go in here. And it's not ready yet. But this shouldn't take long, especially because I'm on the dynamic plan. So basically they can have pre-provisioned websites sitting there for me that they just need to assign to, to my account. They don't need to spin up the machines or anything. So that was the storage account. And then there should be a dynamic. There's the function app. And there should also be a hosting plan. Well, it's not showing up. Now it claims that it's finished, but oh well. So then I click on the function app here and you should see the same UI as you saw in the try function apps before. And then it has a nice uh, wizard-like thing here that will help you. So you can pick what kind of scenario you want to build. Or let's say I want to build the web API thing again. And you can pick the two main languages here. Click create. And 
Det er dig. Oh. Oh, I'm. I don't want to see the tour. I want to. Okay. So I apparently created a trigger that's based on a queue. That's not my intention, but I'll just make another one. So here's some templates that you can pick from. So let's say I want to do the the web trigger, the HTTP trigger. I'll find it here and I'll just give it a name here. So I'll just go with that name and I can here decide, oh, should I be logged in or can anybody call it? I'll pick anonymous this time. And then it'll give me this boilerplate code that I can start from. And then I can go write my little script or whatever I need in here and then save and it's live. And if I want to test it, I can just copy the URL again here and let's hope I have more luck this time. So the right name, hello, who got there? So, so they'll just return whatever I put in the query string here. But that, so now this is running and you can call it and I could call from my mobile app and I pay per request that's coming in. Yeah, so that's the promise that's super easy to get started with and then things start to get more complicated, obviously, but um, let's just look here. That was making it with the portal. So, so now I'm going to give you some background to what's inside this function app. And this might be a little hairy, but it's a very good thing to know when you have problems. Um, so basically the function app, is, it has, there's a file structure on that web server. And you can go look at that file structure. I'll show you in a minute how you do it. Um, but in there, there's some information that's interesting because all this configuration of my function, that's just files on the file system. So there's, in the data folder up here, there's a host file. In that, there's, in this secret folder there, you can find those secrets that was in the URI. So if you want to change them manually, not that you probably should, but you can go in there and look at them. There's some log files, so if your function has problems, you can go into the log files folders and find your specific function app and look at the logs for that one. This one is not really relevant until you start to do deployments, but that's the kudu. Kudu is the the engine that's running behind the app, Azure Web App, uh, to to serve like the FTP access to it and the Git integration, all that stuff is running in that Kudu engine. And inside the side folder, you will see there's a w, www root folder, and inside that folder is some interesting files. There's the host JSON. That's the configuration of the entire function runtime. And then there's a folder named whatever you called your function app. So in, when I made this one, I had one Q, Q trigger C sharp one. And inside that file folder, there's a function. That's the configuration of that single function. And there's the run. That's the source code that you saw. But this file structure, you can actually browse. So if I just go back over here, you can see some of it is they trying to help me show it in the UI here. So if I click on the integrate, they made a UI for that function JSON file. Uh, but I can also go advanced and then I will just see what is inside of it. So, so, but I can do a lot of things with the UI here. I can go back to develop and if I open this thing up here, I can actually see the files here and I could add files or stuff like that. I can also edit that file here directly. Uh, but it's good to know when something is not working, especially when you get later on. Uh, so, but basically here you configure the bindings for this function. So what I am doing here is um, I'm making a HTTP trigger. So that's this coming HTTP requests in. I called it request. So if we go back to the code here, it has to be called request or EQ, right? And it's in, but I could also have out. So here there's an out binding. So I'll return something and it's an HTTP. It doesn't make much sense for the HTTP, but if it was a queue, you can imagine I could configure my queue here. So I would write something on a queue 
too. And if I want to do it from the UI, I can of course do that. I can just go here and say, add a new output. Like I want to put stuff on an Azure storage queue. Select. And then I have to give the parameter a name. So that's what I have to put in my function, my method declaration. And what is the actual queue that the content is going to be on. But this is very easy for, because I can just do this. And here's the storage account where the, where the queue is going to be created in. Uh, so now I have... Do, 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 do. I'll go back to my develop here so I can do and string out this and let's just put that well this is the good thing about this site scrolling thing let's say I want to put the name on that queue there so I'll do this and just save it and Let's see, we can see the logs down here, so I can actually... So now it's complaining, it cannot compa compile. Because... For some reason. <coughs> the type of... Uh, Um, question is, maybe I'm confused here, but now I should be able to do this, and then fails. Well, she shouldn't. Oh well, I was not supposed to show this anyways. Let's let's skip that for now. You can always look at it later. Don't want to waste your time with debugging. Um. So, so that's that's creating it from the portal. But as .NET developers, we would not want to sit in that portal and code anything more than a few lines of code. So that's where things start to get a little complicated. I'll skip these ones for now. So basically, we want to be in Visual Studio because that's the tool we love. And uh, yeah, how are we going to do that? We need to install some stuff. So we need to install the Azure SDK and the functions tooling, and it needs this Azure Functions CLI, which is a node tool of all things for the local debugging experience. And I don't know if it's time-wise, it's smart to take a break now or... No, let me just show you how easy it is to actually build a function app in Visual Studio, and then we can get some pictures maybe. So let's close this one. So if you have those tools installed, um, which and this slide deck, by the way, is on the interweb, so you can find it and use the links in the slide deck if you want to get started. But basically, when you have the tools installed, you get a new project template. It's called Functions, and it's still in preview, so it's not completely without bugs. But uh, then you pick that one, and you say, good. And then you get this project here. So you get the host JSON that you saw in the www root here, and that's it. And then you right-click it and say, I want to add a new function. And then you get the same kind of dialog that you got in the portal before. You can pick from all these pre-made ones. And let's just do the HTTP trigger again. And this is create here. And now I have my code in Visual Studio here. And I might think everything is awesome, but really is it? Let's say request dot, where's my type completion? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that awesome because basically this just gives you the same as the, the portal. But I have a solution to that that I'll show you after the, the break. Uh, but just to prove that this is working and you can actually develop locally, you can actually set a breakpoint here. Do F5 like you would expect in Visual Studio. And then it will fire up this nice 
console window runs in the background and complain about some stuff that I'm missing. But it doesn't matter because there's still a URL here that I can paste into my browser. So I should be able to do this and say, no, everything is breaking. Good thing I have another one. It might be that I have something else running in the background. Let's just switch to my pre-cooked dinner here. So I have this one. Let's see if that's working. Nougat framework, <coughs> nice. Nope, no, no, that's awesome. Let's see here. Mm. What happened? That's why you shouldn't make your presentation a few days in advance. Well, it's supposed to be very easy. Yeah, well, I've never seen that error before. I don't know. Well, the point of it being that it should be the familiar experience where you can F5 debug, set breakpoints, inspect variables and stuff. Um, but yeah, the tooling, as I said, is in preview, and this is the kind of problems that hopefully is going to be resolved. Yeah, I wonder what I did, because I tested it this morning, and something broke. So this one is better for some reason. Yeah, but it doesn't contain any functions, apps, in yet, so. Let's try an empty... Well, yeah, and it's probably my machine that's X. But that's okay for now because I have another solution here. Um, is somebody going to stop me when we have to eat pizzas, right? No. Okay. Ah. Uh. Um, hmm, that's a little annoying for me because, but it doesn't really matter because my point was that the point was that this is not the best experience when you are editing these uh, C sharp script files within Visual Studio because you don't get the full experience, you don't get type completion as you're used to. Mm -hmm. So basically, what you want to do is you want to create a class library, uh, which I've done here and have the code in that one, because then everything should be working. So I can actually type request, and it will tell me, okay, that's the stuff I was looking for before. Oh, okay. Um, so the next part of the presentation is actually how do we make these class libraries inside Visual Studio and deploy them to Azure Functions. So we get the benefit of running functions, but we are in the development environment, we know, so we 
can build things fast and we can test them locally and we just use this runtime or hosting platform and it's not this stupid web editor we have to use because who's going to build anything serious where you're sitting in a web editor? I don't think anybody. It's fine for prototyping but it's not fine if you want to build stuff that goes into production, I assume. Yeah. At least not with my clients. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's different if you're a startup and you just need to get stuff out of the door. Um, so let's just hop back to the presentation because we might as well keep going until we get some pizzas. Um, so basically this second part is continuous integration and that's the how do we get code from my local machine into the cloud without lifting a finger? Um, that's what we're going at here. Um, and there's a lot of good things about Azure Functions running on Azure Web Apps because we can use all the same deployment mechanisms that's supported by Azure Web Apps to deploy Azure Functions. As long as we remember the structure of the function app, how files were laid out, then it's all good. We just need to place the files in the correct locations. Yeah. So we can use Git if we wanted to. You can have a Git integration with Azure Web Apps. When, if you do that, then the function app in the portal over here, uh, not this one, my other portal here. This will all get read only, so you can't edit it in the portal anymore if you have the Git integration. Yeah, that's probably fine because you don't want somebody going into production and starting editing code that supposed to be deployed from source control. Um, but that's something you need to be aware of. That's how it works. Um, you can also use FTP if you feel like that's the modern approach. Or you can use web deploy that you probably know if you've done any web development on .NET. Um, and there's an, also an API that you can upload files with in this Kudu tool. Uh, this one I'll just skip for the sake of time for now. Um, but you just, I have it running, so I'll just show you my my demo one here, so you can see. So in this resource group, I have a few function apps. I have this one, sjkpdemo.git, which is obviously integrated with Git. And, and now I'll just do some dirty stuff in a moment, if it loads. So I have, and this one it says, oh, read only because you have version control set up. Okay, how did I set up version controls? Oh, I went into the function app settings down here and then there's some shortcuts for basically features that are in uh, normal apps, web apps, um, but they have a shortcut here for the Git integration or continuous integration. And uh, yeah, I can go in here. I'll just disconnect it and I'll set it up again. Because I'm a baller and all my demos are working, so I might as well just disconnect this one and <laughs> break this demo as well. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so the it is very easy to use the UI here. You just go in, pick, okay, I want to use GitHub because that's where my code for this demo is, but it could also be some of these other external services. And then it will ask me, okay, what? how should I log in? I've already set that up. Which project is it? Okay, it's this. Azure Functions <laughs> demo project with brands, so I could have like a staging environment that took from a staging brands if that's how I wanted to do things. I just do everything in the master because um, a baller like that? No, because this is just me doing some demos. So now it's set up and then if I go into Git over here, now let's just prove that there's something running in that one first. So you can see that my changes is actually does something. So this is the same HTTP function that returns my name, yeah, but that's the one I'm gonna change in a bit. 
I'm just going to do this one and say name Simon. And this one is hopefully working. And that now it's the first time that this is being hit for a while. So you can see it takes some time, some time, some time, some time. It can take a fair amount of time. It wasn't too slow this time, but probably not something you want in an end user scenario. But that's this function was not awake. Nobody had called it for several days since I set it up. So, But now if I call it again, it answers instantly because they keep it alive for a little bit. They don't just call it and turn it off immediately. So. Now it's fast. And then I try to edit my code over here. And I find my function app demos here. And it was this HTTP trigger execution context. And I go in my run file here and I do, can I even edit it over here? Yes, I can. Click right here and say rocking. And I go s commit. Yes. So now that's saved. Um, and if we're looking over in my function apps, go to this continuous integration here, we can see maybe we cannot see that it's updating, but it should. It should pick up the, the new. Yeah, so it's a, it has already copied the code over, so it actually did what it was supposed to. And if I call my function again now, it says rocking. So now I have some sort of integration, but I'm still just editing flat files, so I have no way of testing this locally, really. Uh, that's why I'm a little against this approach, but this also works for web apps. You can deploy code into web apps the same way here. Have a Git repository with all your HTML files, images, whatever, and deploy them to your production this way or to a test environment or whatever. Um, and it also works for Azure functions. Um, there's one thing though that you need to be uh, a little trick that you w have to Google or know. And that is what, what is the root folder for my functions in my repository? Because you might not notice, but I have um, my function apps or the folders with my function apps were inside this folder here. So I have this one and then there was this. This is a function app. This is a function app. This is a function app. Uh, so these ones contain the function JSON and the run file. So my root for my function app hosts is actually this folder. If I don't specify anything, it will deploy everything from here. And there's no function apps here, so this will not work. Uh, so I have to tell it where the root is. And I can do that by setting this application setting here on the, on the web app. So I tell it, okay, the root of where my function apps are stored in source control is this folder. Yeah, and that's black magic or you can find documentations or somebody who posted it from the product team on Stack Overflow because one guy asked or whatever. Um, but now it's here if you want to do this kind of integration. You have to set this to one, otherwise we'll just deploy the root from the Git repository. And if you don't believe me, I can go to this Kudu portal, which is that backend service that I can use to monitor things on my web app. So when I go in here, I actually have a, this file browser where I can see the files that makes up my function app. So if I go into site, go into the v root, I can see the stuff that, everything that got pulled in from the GitHub. So that was the content of this folder here, is now. So this tool is very useful if you don't know about it. If you haven't done any Azure development, you might not know about it, but if you do any website or function app development, you basically write your host name and put SCM in the URL. And then you get to this portal here where you can browse the files. You can see processes running on that machine that is hosting your function app or your web app. You can install site extensions and 
yeah, see log streams and stuff like that. You can also kill processes. It, it will reboot them instantly if you kill them, but sometimes there can be files that are locked for some reason and then it might be a good idea to just kill the process. Um, you can do that in here. So this tool is very useful. Um, yeah. So, so my point of showing this part of it is, is this good application lifecycle management or good continuous integration? I don't know, I don't think so, but of course I um, have some schooling and other people might have other opinions. I think it's okay for simple solutions. If I just had like a simple HTML page with my CV or my company products and there's no backend to it, yeah, then this might be fine. There's not, it's not very advanced, there's not much to test or anything, so I can deploy it this way with Git integration. Uh, but if my code is more complicated and I want to make unit tests and stuff like that, then I might not want to. Basically what I do now is that I'm committing the source code to the Git and then it's just being copied from Git into the web app. I don't want my source code in my web app. Azure web apps can compile the source code actually for me, but I don't want that. I want to know that my code can compile before I try to deploy it to production, right? And I want to test it before it's in production. So, but again, like I said, that's because I'm old school and I like compiled code. Uh, so we need a better LM story that will make me happy because I want my code compiled on a build server. I want to test it on a build server yeah, and stuff like that. And then I want it to go into my environments. And environments here can be one if I'm only having one production environment, but it can also be several environments if I have like test, pre-prod and production or whatever setup you have here. Yeah. So I need that story or that's the story I'm going for when I'm building Azure Functions. Yeah. So that requires a little extra effort. Um, but so, so far we have not seen any pre-compiled function. We've seen some scripts and that's been deployed and then the function runtime actually compiles it for us and then that's what gets called. Yeah, but we can pre-compile the functions. So we deploy an, an assembly instead of the script files. Um, and s some reasons to do this is that we saw there was no IntelliSense in Visual Studio. There was no IntelliSense in the browser. I can't live without IntelliSense. I need IntelliSense, otherwise I can't be productive. Um, so that could be one reason that you want pre-compiled function. It could also be the ALM story from before that I don't like to deploy code into production that gets compiled on my production server and then it's running there. Uh, it could also be that my code base is large. Then I want to show you this last uh, part that's actually also what a lot of people have been asking about. Um, well, maybe one thing before that. There's been some issues with my demos, which is not acceptable, Microsoft. No, <laughs> no, the, the, as you, s I told you it was preview, the tooling on Windows, and that's what it is. There's some problems. The tool, the error I saw today, I haven't seen it before. I've seen other errors, so you can expect there to be some errors. And there is a lot of, dependency between Visual Studio, the CLI tooling, they get updated fairly frequent. And uh, yeah, don't pick functions if you want like, right now at least, if you want a complete, smooth, steady, everything is working perfectly, flawlessly experience. Pick it if you want some of the things that are unique, unique to the service, right? And then that's how it is right now. Uh, but they're trying hard to make it better all the time. That's as you could see also. And this pre-compiled functions actually, support for that is, I think it was released in January this year, so it's not very old. And I mean, I was complaining a lot before this feature was there because I was like, you can't expect me to be productive without type uh, intelligence and type completion, right? You can't expect me to build anything real sitting in that editor in the portal. Uh, I can use that for a demo, I can use it for a simple prototyping, but I will not, have a production environment where that's my IDE. That's, you can't, that, that's not acceptable to me. So I was very vocal about that and other people were too. So eventually they gave us this tool here that we can make pre-compiled functions. 
and uh, then now I'm happy because now it's everything that I know from web jobs basically, but I get the the nice features of the dynamic hosting plan or the consumption hosting plan where I don't have to pay for it. Um, so let's sh show you what it's all about. <coughs> so yeah, as you probably guessed, we move the code to a class library. We need to add some uh, nuggets and because it is very much related to Azure Web Jobs. It's actually the Azure Web Jobs nuggets we need to add. Um, and then we need to change a little bit in our function .json file. We just have to put in, in, yeah, it's called script file, but it can actually point to an assembly as well. And then we need to point to the entry point, which is the function to invoke in, in that assembly. Uh, so that's the two things you need to add to a function file and then you can actually use functions with some class libraries that you built. So that's not too bad, right? Um, let's see here, yeah. So that's all there is to it. And so basically what we can do now is we can build a console application in Visual Studio. We have to have this function that the function runtime will call, but all our other logic we can place in other classes and structure the way we want. We can make unit tests of that code and everything is good. And then we can deploy it. And the way we can deploy it is basically we can right click and publish from Visual Studio if you like that, or we can copy the files manually to, to the function app in Azure. Uh, that's fine if we're doing testing or simple solutions, but maybe if we have more people developing on our solution, we want the deployment to be automated somehow. And the traditional tool we as web developers, .NET web developers would pick was, would be web deploy packages. And for some reason that's broken in this project template. So we can't make a web deploy package in that template. Uh, I'm assuming that's something that they're gonna fix. Um, but for right now it's broken, so we have to make a normal web app project and then copy the files into that. Um, and that can of course be automated, so it's not too bad. And I'll just show you how my setup in this demo app here looks. And you can steal this if you want to do something yourself. Um, there's, there's a few ways to do it, but the way I got it working for today is I have my pre-confiled function library here. It doesn't contain much because it's still the same code as before. This project actually referencing my common library up here. So there's a third party that I'm also building where all my logic or whatever it is, is. And because I'm using traditional class libraries, it all works like you would expect. I reference common here and it's all good. I couldn't do that if it was a function app project here. It doesn't have a references, so I can't reference anything here. Then for my pre-compiled function here, I have to copy my code. Ooh, there's a lot of files, but that's the output of my, my, my class library down here that I just copy into this bin folder here. And that part I have automated by just some X copy commands that post built event or pre built event for this that just copies the file up here. And then my function JSON looks like this. I have these two that you saw on the slides before. But now it's like deploying any other web application. Uh, if I could deploy this one here, I can say publish here and then publish it from my machine to Azure Web Apps. That works. But if I want to make the package, then that's not possible. It just breaks. So what I have is I have this function deploy project here, which is an old web project. And I have the same structure in here as my function app. And now I probably need to build this one so it copies things up. Uh, so because all these files are not checked into source control. Uh, let's see if it, yeah. So now all the files are here and it's the exact same structure as in this project down here. But this one I can actually make a web deploy package out of. Yeah. And then I can deploy it. So that's a little annoying, but that's how I got it working right now. Um, so you can steal this concept or you can wait for them to fix 
this template so it can also web deploy packages. Um, so, so now I can make this web deploy package, which is basically a zip file that I can have on my local machine, and then I can deploy from that. Uh, but like I said, I wanted to automate everything. I don't want any manual things here. So what I have done is that I have this project checked into Git, as you saw. Uh, I have it in GitHub, but I also have it in my Visual Studio online service. Um, the same code. Let's just see. I'm not skipping anything here. Yes, it's the demo time. And I have that over here. So here's my code. It's in Visual Studio Online. I don't know if you use this. I'm pretty happy with it because I don't have to manage another server. I have to manage a source control server. They do that for me. And I always have the latest and greatest because they update this very frequently. And so I have my code here. So this is what you saw, the, my function deployer thing here. No, it's kind of empty. There's only the the project file and the web config, but not all the all the other folders are not checked in. They're generated by the build server. Um, so I have my my I use the build agents that they provide. So I have it built up here, and uh, it's quite easy to make new build definitions here. So I'll just show you what this build looks like. Uh, I did some testing, as you can see. So there's some failed builds. But if I edit this one, uh, here I think I need to click. Click over here. Edit. Then the build definition contains some tasks, like you would expect. So it restores some nuggets for my solution. Then it builds it. Here's some arguments these are also in the slides so you don't have to read them but these are basically the arguments for the build process to make the web deploy package as well so when it's building it outputs a web deploy package so this i mean this is basically a standard template so i added this and then i added this step down here there's some testing and publishing here uh, testing here so if there was some test assemblies in my project it would also run the unit tests for me don't have to do anything. I don't have any units to test, but <coughs> and then I have this publish the package. So basically, when it's done building, it will look for zip files in the output, and then it will copy the them to a specific artifact named package, because then I can reference that in my deploy stage. But this is my build step here. Not too advanced. I can certainly get way more advanced than that. And let's just look at. A output from the build here. So it, it's all good and it produces some artifacts here. So the drop is the, the bin files, I believe. And my packets here is what I'm interesting, interested in is that web deploy package here. So now I have a web deploy package built by the build server with my functions inside. Uh, now I need to release it or deploy it to my Azure function app. And I have set that up in the release pipeline over here. So there's a part of Team Foundation server that's called release management. And in here you can control your releases. And I have made a release definition that releases to, to Azure. And the way that looks is like this. Here I'll edit it. One step because they did a lot of work to make this super simple, which is a nice thing about being in a micro ecosystem. Things eventually will work very smoothly together because that's what they're going for. In the beginning, there might be some things that's not the easiest, but they're trying to make it very easy. So this setting up this build is like a five, 10 minutes task. So it's like, there's no reason not to do it if you're more than one developer on a project at least. And even if you're just one developer, I still think you should do it because you come back to a project six months later and you can't remember how to deploy it anymore. Uh, if it's in here, it's formalized and there's nothing. Of course, this is the most simple you can think of. So more real life application might be slightly more advanced. But what I do here is I tell it what Azure subscription, what is the name of the function app. For all release management cares, that's just the web app. But it has the folder structure of a function app. 
my web deploy package. And then I point to the package down here that I was produced by my build, and then it just deploys it. And that's pretty much it for an ELM or application lifecycle management setup that just works. It, like you saw, the tooling and the Visual Studio part is a little clunky right now, but the rest of it is just as you would expect, super smooth. So now if I wanted to, I can go into my code. And even if I can't test this locally, I will probably be able to make a change. So let's say my function apps here, I'll say Santa. Yeah, hello Santa plus name. And uh, that's, then I need to commit this change. I probably have to sync first because I did that. Oops, that all went fine. But because I have a setup for both Git and uh, VSTS, I probably have to commit it to the right one as well. So I also push it to the VSTS repository. Yeah, so like that. And now it should. No, no, I can run it locally if it wasn't because my machine is not doing like it should right now. But that's the point of me having both the function project here and this project is not for locally deployment or anything. This is just for deployment purposes. When I test it locally, I'm using this project here if it was working. So I, this is set as my startup project and I would do F5. And if it was, there's something with my environment right now. So well maybe it's not complaining right now. Yeah, it does complain about something, but that's something else. No, it also still has that nougat thing. Uh, so I don't know what I upgraded or what I did to my machine. But if it was working, I would just do that, and now I could hit the endpoints on my local machine, and they would debug into that class library. So it would work like you would expect. Um, so there's a few things, though, when you're doing local development. Uh, there's this app settings file here. Uh, so many of the triggers and bindings you can use, they are relying on Azure storage and you would have to put in your connection string for Azure storage in that file if you're doing local development. Um, that's not required on the portal because it's set up for you. Um, so you need to remove them if you're committing to GitHub like I am. That's why it's not there and that's why some of the red stuff is there when it starts up. But the HTTP thing doesn't require any Azure storage, so it's okay for that one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I have a few more slides of tips and tricks. And what is going on here? I just want to see this. Oh, yeah. This one is for the hardcore people that wants to make many functions. This I, this is not something I'll go through, but this is in the slide deck, so you can copy and paste it if you want to. But this is basically the template for creating the function environment. So if you want to stand up a function environment and you don't want to use the portal to do it, you want to run it from a command line, then you can copy this template and it will set up the environment with a function app and the storage account. Set up the, the required app <coughs> settings on the web app, and that's a one-liner then to make a new function app. Uh, and also, the good thing about using the template is that the template will make it very easy for you to change plans. Uh, because basically, the definition of the plan is here. So if you don't want to be on dynamic anymore, you can delete those things in theory. And then it will not be a dynamic plan. Or you could have two of these server farms. So the service plan or app hosting plan here was originally called server farm, so that's what it's still called in this language. But you could have two of these, one that's dynamic and one that's not dynamic, and you could just reference whichever one you want your app to run on. Um, but yeah, there's a few lines of code here, or JSON. It's probably not called code. And one last thing actually is that you can also inline your function app inside this template. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's possible. So here's the code again, all long one-liner one because it has to be on one line. <laughs> but 
So you could basically make a template that set up many function apps with a lot of code and place it all in this one file and then have one simple button to deploy it all. And that button could look like this. Sorry. Um, so if I go over here to my function. So I actually put the template in this, oh, sorry in this git repository as well. So this function resource group here is that template. And then you can put this kind of button here that deep links to the template file. And then you can click it. And then you'll be taken to the portal. And it will ask you, do you really want to deploy this template that's created by a third party? Oh, actually it doesn't ask. Oh yeah, you, I must agree down here. But then I can fill in the missing things and that's the resource group and the location, I can change it if I don't like the default setting. But then it will create the function app here with my default settings. But it's, it's not that much easier than <laughs> doing it from the portal, but now you have it scripted so you can actually send it to somebody else that doesn't know anything about this stuff and he can do it too. Bloops, this. Yeah, you can version control it too. True. And that's what we like, as developers at least. I know infrastructure guys might not like it as much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, the ARM template is basically the same <coughs> as for an app, a web app, but it's a little the little twist with the dynamic properties there. Uh, and yeah, it's possible to set up host names. So you c if you have your custom mywebapp.se, you can put that in the template too. You, of course, can't do the DNS setup unless you do that in Azure as well. But if you have that somewhere else, you need to have that done before you deploy the template. But then you can have your environment set up in seconds or minutes. Some tips and tricks here. The, one of the first question was that, uh, how long can they run for? And there was five minutes for the dynamic skew. If you're on your own web app, you can remove this limit. I don't know if they changed it yet, but there's some talk about on the, I mean, I don't think they're gonna change it on the dynamic plane. They want you to write function that execute in less than five minutes. That's kind of the idea behind function is that you're not building long running things. But if you're on your own web hosting plan, they might, I think it is changed so that they run forever basically. Uh, that's not good design if you have applications that will do that, but it's it's not their problem because you chose to host it yourself, basically. Uh, so what happens when the five minutes have elapsed? Yeah, they give you five seconds, uh, and then you are getting terminated. If it's shutting down, like normally, like it should shut down the web app, they'll also in tell you five seconds in advance by using this cancellation token, so you actually have, if they are rebooting the server and stuff like that and it's planned maintenance, you can also listen to this cancellation token and then close down gracefully. But this is also there in web jobs if you want to use it. So is, is it only to add this uh, parameter cancellation token? Yeah, and then you need, automatically. yeah, then they pass it in and you, you need to listen to it. So if you have something that's running for a long time and you cannot stop and listen to that every five, at least every five seconds, then you're still screwed. But so, so I have some problems with that in some of my applications, but that's not their fault. That's my applications because I have long running SQL transactions in my case. No, no, it will, if it's there, they'll pass it in. Yes. Um, yeah. There was some, yeah, that host JSON file that I briefly mentioned, that is actually very important to look into if you're building stuff with queues because it you can control how many functions you want to run at the same time. And unless your entire pipeline is scalable, you might have something that you're writing to or reading from that can't handle 60 functions going nuts or whatever it is. Uh, 60 is the maximum number of function hosts that will, it will spin up at the same time. But every function host can execute multiple functions at the same time. So it can get really parallel quite fast if you have a queue that you're reading from, for instance. So imagine this, this is the order queue example. 
there's like 10,000 orders just placed on the queue instantly. Then the function app runtime will say, oh, the queue is ginormous. I must start up a lot of instances, try to process this as fast as possible. And then you have a SQL on the back of the function that just dies because it will not be able to cope with it or whatever it is. So in here you can tweak some of these settings with how many parallel processes do you want to have at the same time? When should it try to scale out and stuff like that? Uh, there's still some settings you can't control, but I'm assuming they're gonna add more here. But check this file if you are having s things that scales too, too much for your liking. And then when something fails, if you're using queues, there's a poison queue where the message goes on. So you can go look at the poison queue, make a job that reprocesses the poison queue. But there's also in this file you've set how many times should I try to process this queue message before throwing it on the poison queue. And the default is five. So it'll try five times. But the problem right now is that it's five times like doot, 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 and then if it's another service that's down, yeah, then it's probably not going to come back up instantly. So, but that's something they're adding. So some exponential back off there. The Kudu portal I showed you. This is my probably favorite tool. So, if you ever do anything with web apps or functions, use this when you have issues. And then there's another editor. So if you don't like that editor that they provide. Um, <coughs> There's actually also what they call the app service editor up here. And that's basically the forerunner to Visual Studio Code was that they built this Monaco, was the code name for it, editor that could run in the browser. And that's embedded in Azure Web Apps, so you can use it to edit functions too. And then you have something here that looks a lot like Visual Studio Code. I don't know if they update it with the same frequency they do with Visual Studio Code. But yeah, you can edit stuff in here and get some some s another editor experience, but it's still in the portal and I still don't like doing development in the web, <laughs> web uh, browser. Uh, yeah, you might, this is like a, so every job execution has and that gets an inv invocation ID, and you might want to track that in sp maybe for logging purposes, so you know which one crashed and which one did not. So that you can actually add this execution context to to your uh, function uh, parameters, and then it will be passed in, and you can get the evocation ID from that. Uh, it's not super useful, but it might be useful if you want to track how many we're running at a specific time and stuff like that. And that brings us to the next one. How do we do locking? Yeah, basically you have to pick whatever locking framework you want to use. There's not very much locking built in. There's that trace writer that you saw, but that's not a very enterprise ready locking solution or good locking solution, but might be good enough for smaller things. But if you're in Azure, you might have heard about application insights, that might be what you're using, but you can also use whatever other locking tool you want to use. Um, there was also a monitor tab. If we go back one step here. Um, so I can actually click on any function here. Let's take my pre-compiled one. And then I can look at the monitor tab here and I can see the last the latest 20 uh, vocations of that one. But this page here is pretty bad. Yeah. So it is okay for simple debugging, but it doesn't refresh very fast. You have to click this button, but it reads a blob storage that's not instantly flushed to, so it's not always up to date and things like that. But, but it's there and they spend some time on making it. And then there's also this live event stream that I can't get to work, but there's, they tried to build some locking, but if you're building serious stuff, don't rely on this, make your own locking. And application insight is one option uh, that I have used in my projects, but the things you need to be aware, uh, aware of is that the function app itself is basically like a co console application. So if you've done application insights in 
web apps, it's very easy because that's what it's tailored towards. Console apps, you have to make sure that when your app terminates, you flush the whatever log statements are in the buffer. So you need to build that into your application. Uh, otherwise, you might lose some log statements. Uh, and you need to be able to configure your your application insights from code, but that's probably possible. Uh, that's a lot of articles on that. Uh, and I mean, this is because of the state functions are in right now. It's a six month old product. This is something that was going to be built into the product, I would imagine, fairly soon as well. So we don't have to worry about this ourselves. This is my last, second to last slide. So, where to get help? Yeah. Basically, ask questions on Stack Overflow. The Microsoft product team actually goes and answers questions or points to a duplicate of a question. Uh, they have time set aside for that, I think, so they will actually answer questions. Uh, if you have like feature requests, you can either put them on user voice or just do like me and put them <laughs> in the GitHub issue list. It's kind of not so nice, but <laughs> <laughs> that's also possible. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, the GitHub, everything they do is open sourced. Uh, so this one is actually the documentation. I don't know why I put that link there. But there's another GitHub repository that's called uh, Web Scripts or something like that. Let's just go up here. Because the code name for it was Web Script. So in here is most of the code um, and there's a lot of issues that you can actually browse and see why is things not working or things like that and they're pretty active in here and they actually respond to you opening stuff so that's about it and then you can find me well you can find all the material in this GitHub repository, and you're welcome to just open issues in there or tweet me or whatever. You want to get in contact with me if you have any questions that regards to functions.